Would you like to buy a bridge? The Brooklyn Bridge. It'll help you get from your laptop to your desktop and back again. It's just one example of a host of new computer peripherals being developed especially for laptop users. Today, we'll take a look at laptop peripherals on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, these are two Toshiba T1000 laptop computers. This is the basic machine. Our viewers will see this screen on the top. This is the basic LCD super twist you get with it. I added a peripheral to this machine. I have a little switch on the side, and I throw it instant backlighting, better screen in low light conditions. When we talk about peripherals for laptops, it suggests that these machines don't do what they ought to do in the first place, so I have to spend a lot of money on these peripherals. Why can't they just build a laptop that has everything in it in the first place? <laughs> well, the computer designer uh, is considering the manufacturing trade-offs, the cost of the parts, the cost of construction. Mm -hmm. With laptops, you also have size, weight, power consumption. So you go from, say, a half a meg system up to a full megabyte of memory and add modem circuitry, it's mm -hmm. going to pull the batteries down a lot yeah. faster. So those choices then are left up to the consumer. They can add those parts off the shelf and customize their own machine. Gary, today we'll take a look at some of the most important peripherals for laptop users. We'll see devices that add memory, devices that add battery power. We'll take a look at devices that let your laptop communicate with other computers. And we'll take a look at some battery-operated printers that you can carry around with your laptop. Now, one problem every laptop user has is sharing files between the laptop and a desktop. We're going to start with a profile of one user who solves that problem using a program called LapLink. Ricardo Martinez is a physician working at Stanford University Hospital. He has also authored numerous articles for medical journals and books. Dr. Martinez has found that a portable computer with an accessory or two can make his life a lot easier. The one I have here uh, is the one I use the most of all. And with that modem, I can get into the National Library of Medicine and do computerized medical searches. I can then take the part of that search that I want and transfer that onto my data disk that's on the uh, laptop. Then taking the laptop with me to the library, I can have those articles, uh, pull the articles if I want it. I can get the full text off the National Library of Medicine and keep that with me. Dr. Martinez uses a simple cable and software connection called LapLink to download segments of larger files from his PC to his laptop computer. The portable then becomes his principal writing tool and reference library, whether he is at home, at the hospital, or at a distant medical conference. Uh, certainly the, the portability has been nice for me because I can take it on the airplane, I can take it to another city, and uh, any meeting I'm in with, with another physician, uh, for example, I'm working on, on a project with another physician. When we meet, we can have the work done right then and there uh, on the computer. Dr. Martinez foresees a time when the portable computer might play a role in diagnosis and treatment, especially in remote areas. But for now, he is satisfied that by helping him speed up his research, it improves the quality of his work. Joining us in the studio now is Mark Epley, president of Traveling Software, a company which specializes in laptop peripherals. Next to Mark is Keith Comer of Toshiba, known to many laptop users around the country as their private online laptop techie. <laughs> Gary. Mark, these uh, displays are looking real good on the portables now, and you can buy it with a hard disk, right? Right. Um, are these desktop machines, are they dinosaurs now, like the old computer rooms full of computer equipment? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you see an evolution going on in the marketplace, and, and I think 
what, what we see happening is our laptop computers are becoming the, the personal personal computer a la a small form factor desktop alternative. You have 386, 286 processors and high-res displays and hard disks. And that's, that's so where, that's where we're still ahead. complimentary then anyway. Huh? Yes. <laughs> okay. now, you have, a, you have a, a program here that's uh, called Battery Watch. I guess there's a, this is one of the problems with laptops, right, is that the batteries tend to go down in, at times when, which are inappropriate, like when you're flying on an airplane. Right? Right. <laughs> uh, what does Battery Watch do? Um, well, Battery Watch, well, you're right. The, the, the age-old problem of the battery going dead while, you, while you're using it, it uh, on the road, and that's, that was strong motivation for us to do this mm -hmm. product. So what we've done is we've dismantled 18 different laptop uh, versions, taken them all apart and put, put them in our labs with uh, current monitoring equipment on mm -hmm. them and measuring the floppy drive, the display, the hard disk. And what we've come up with is very accurate calculations uh, in real time. It's living in the background, 15K of code that's constantly monitoring what's going on in the machine. And you have, like a fuel gauge in your car, your, your uh, time to empty hmm. um, in hours and minutes and, and, and with a, a bar chart. And, and you're saying so it's sensitive to your particular machine and your particular use. Yeah, and it's constantly changing. It depends on the, your use of the uh, laptop. For instance, this has a hard drive, and I flip this switch back here. It turns the, uh, the hard, hard disk off, mm -hmm. and then you see the, uh, the time goes up in hours and minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions about the batteries themselves, because I'm a little confused here. If I bought a battery, is it gonna, uh, are two batteries going to have exactly the same discharge characteristics? So if I change a battery uh, later on, is it going to uh, act the same way as it did before? Uh, no. In fact, you can adjust battery watch for that. Every battery has different characteristics, mm -hmm. amp hour ratings. And if, like, if you replace the, the factory battery here with a, with a higher amp hour battery, you could adjust battery watch to compensate for that. And you mm -hmm. have very accurate okay. readings up to 99% accuracy. OK, Keith, now suppose you're using battery watch and you find your battery's about to die on the 1200. What do you do? Well, uh, give the computer to work. <laughs> we, uh, We've set this up with uh, battery packs that come off while the machine's on. Even if you're in the middle of something, you can turn it off. It uh, checks to make sure everything is spun down, the hard drive's parked and everything, and then it goes off. Then you just pull this battery right out of here, reach into your briefcase, and you've got another battery, your pocket. Which backpack. you could have been charging in that thing. Right, this is the uh, offline charger. You can put mm -hmm. three of them in here and okay. charge them all night. The little lights tell you which ones are ready. And then you just drop a new battery in here, turn the machine back on, and with the resume mode enabled, it comes right back up the same place you were. Uh -huh. But you don't lose anything. It gets you back right. where you are, back to where you were right before. Back where you were. Okay, turn it around, and you've got a, a sort of expansion slot on that too. And tell us what kinds of, kinds of things you could put in there. All right in the back here, we've got uh, an extra slot, like a uh, like an IBM's expansion slot. It come. We have a different form factor and, and size, and obviously batter, uh, power. Capabilities. We try mm -hmm. and do these all in CMOS. Uh, this panel comes off, and then extra cards can slide in here. This is a RAM card. We've got a third-party speech card here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of there are a lot of modems that go in this slot. This machine also allows you to put a modem inside, so as not to use up the slot, so that you can have yet another, some other device in there. Okay. Okay. That does bring up the question, though, about expansion uh, as chassis in general. Is if I want to put in standard IBM boards, how do I handle that? Right. We have another card just about like this one with a big plug on it. Mm -hmm. And there's a cable that runs around, and we have an expansion chassis that's, okay. that's not terribly portable, but it holds five regular IBM cards. You can use, usually this is enough for carrying around. It's got all the standard kind of ports mm -hmm. built okay. in, the hard drive and all. If you have a network or some... Uh, some other kinds of cards you want to use while you're at the office, you bring this in, drop it down, plug the card in, and it's and you're talking to uh, the other device. Keith, we have about a half minute left. Uh, dump the 1200. You've got a T1000 over there, and right. you've got one more thing to show us, which is the RAM card with that. Explain it and show us how you put it in. Well, the RAM card is uh, it's an extra 768K of RAM. We uh, you take the screws out, take the top off like this. RAM card drops right in here. It's trivial to install. Now you've got the 512 that's already in here, plus that 768 gets you 1.2 megabytes. That extra RAM can be used either as uh, EMS or as a what we call hard RAM, which is a RAM disk that doesn't go dead when the power goes mm -hmm. off. So it acts like a, a very tiny hard drive, really, yeah. in practice. Uh, this and machine, the of course, only has the one floppy. So it's right, has one floppy. Yeah. It does have a DOS ROM. The ROM is uh, is drive C, so it boots mm -hmm. to DOS from that drive, drive C, yeah. and then this RAM card acts as drive D. Keith, Mark, thank you very much. In just a minute, we'll show you how to add things to your laptop even if it doesn't have an expansion slot. Stay tuned.
Joining us in the studio now is Chuck Weston. He's editor of Portable Computer Review, a magazine for laptop users. And back with us again, Mark Epley of Traveling Software. Chuck, one of the problems, of course, with the laptops is if we like to put standard cards in there, you have a little kind of, kind of a problem there. Uh, tell us about one under. How does that solve it? Uh, this is a special interface that allows you to put an IBM board under a laptop, mm -hmm. a small laptop computer that doesn't have an external slot. Uh, this is the interface. I'll show you this uh, Toshiba here. This interface board uh, fits the Toshiba uh, slot, which is not a standard IBM size slot. This connector is the connector that fits on the IBM board. And you put, put this in here and put your IBM board on it. And the IBM board would fit inside this housing. Mm -hmm. And there's a Velcro strip here that you stick to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then the two screws that hold the interface here um, would hold this one under underneath. Then your IBM uh, interface connector would show out on this end. Uh -huh. You would hook your peripherals out there. So you can, you can put one board in there. One, IB, one standard uh, size IBM board. Now, isn't there also an option for a hard disk that you can put in there? Yeah, this, these, these uh, one unders can be had with a 20 meg hard disk. And the, the power comes from the internal battery power from this. Uh, from the laptop. It runs the hard disk also? It would run the hard okay. disk also. So you're showing that on the 1200, the hard disk would be viable if you put it on like a 1000 or the 1200 on a 1, without the hard if you disk. Had a, yeah, if you had a smaller computer that you really like, the laptop, the option of not having to to upgrade to another computer, you can buy the hard disk and add it on mm -hmm. and, uh, and still have the uh, you know, laptop that you're familiar with in the July. Okay, well, one thing laptop users want is a little printer to carry around with them, and we have two examples of them here. And Chuck, let's start with you. What's the Axonix? This is a, a portable printer. This comes in uh, in uh, two varieties. This one is uh, is not the battery powered, and this has an external power source. Mm -hmm. um, it has either on the back, uh, it has a connector, a Centronics connector, or the standard 25-pin uh, connector that you mm -hmm. can use a standard 25-pin uh, cable on. This is a ribbon-driven. So that's a regular ribbon. Printer. Yeah, ribbon dot matrix printer. Um, and it's very light and small. It fits in a briefcase, and uh, it'll do the job on the road. If you have to have battery power, the uh, battery-powered version is uh, will get the job done. Yeah. But not many people. What does it sell for, approximately? Uh, about five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the Diconics is a really little one, Mark, and you sell that one, I think. Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah, we sell that. this in our, our catalog. It weighs, uh, with batteries, uh, 3.75 pounds, and it's a, uh, it prints on plain paper. It uses inkjet technology, the same that the Hewlett Packard ThinkJet. Mm -hmm. In fact, it uses exact same cartridges, which are readily uh, available, and it's a uh, very, very nice output. What about uh, the power? Where's the power source on there? Uh, the power is, is in uh, rechargeable C batteries mm -hmm. here. And you, you get about 50 pages per charge, so you get a, a, a real good uh, output for your charge. So this kind of device will have a whole airplane full of people printing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's very quiet, too. Well, that's what's nice, right, if you're on the airplane, at least it doesn't clatter like, uh, like an impression. Yeah. What's the other little box you have there? Now, this is, this is a, a brand new product in our catalog. It's a, uh, it's, it's a fax. It's a portable fax, and it weighs uh, uh, less than a pound, and it connects by a serial cable into a laptop computer. And you can transmit fax to any Group 3 fax, which is a standard mm -hmm. worldwide. So you can sit in your laptop computer in a hotel room and transmit uh, uh, an image of your letterhead, just like you dropped mm -hmm. a, a letter in a uh, So you, you don't, wouldn't a have a scanner meter. attached necessarily, but... Uh, no, you would, you would do that... You're faxing out of yeah. the memory of your computer. Yeah, to yeah, a you real would, you would do that in your office. You'd it scan in, like, like I've done. Mm -hmm. I've scanned in my letterhead and my signature. I have two files, a letterhead and signature file. And I use WordStar, and I, I write my letter and insert the letterhead and signature file sandwich in between what I've written in WordStar, mm -hmm. and I fax it out here, and it comes out at the destination just like I... Uh, uh, it looks I, like you would scan so a piece of paper. Is this, yeah. only, is this yeah. only outgoing? Yeah. It, it will receive, receive. It will okay. receive, and you can view a fax on your display. Uh, it doesn't have the, uh, obviously, with this you, size, you don't get, the hard, copy. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get yeah. the hard copy, but you could print it out right. uh, with a printer. <laughs> <laughs> a portable printer. So there yeah. you go. As you were saying, Gary, what do you need a desktop for? you got everything you need That's right. <laughs> just about. <laughs> okay, we're going to be back in just a minute. We're going to look at modems next. Now, if you had your ideal modem, what would it have in it? Probably a tiny cellular phone, so you wouldn't have to go around looking for a phone jack. There actually is such a product. Wendy Woods has a report. Whether a customer has a problem with an IBM typewriter or an IBM mainframe, the distress call starts here. IBM Services is Doug. May I help you? 
This customer service representative is part of a sophisticated dispatch network maintained on powerful mainframes. The communication center's computers can keep track of a customer's history, the parts inventory, and most importantly, can locate the closest, most qualified engineer to answer the call. That person is located on what's probably the world's most sophisticated pager, a portable terminal which displays details of the assignment and allows the engineer to carry on a two-way dialogue for more information. The transmission is sent back and forth across high-frequency radio waves. In other words, the engineer can virtually access all the information in here on here. It has been the most universally well-accepted tool that we ever gave any of our customer engineers. If you stop one in the street and ask them what is the one tool that he could not do without, he'll tell you his DCS portable terminal. Don't expect to see this system available to the public anytime soon. IBM has no plans to sell the technology that makes all this work. The bottom line is that this system is just too valuable to share. In San Francisco, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us in the studio now is our friend George Morrow, computer pundit and a guy who knows a little bit about portables, having designed the Morrow Pivot. And back with us, Mark Epley of Traveling Software. And over there, about to give us an interesting demo soon, is Chuck Weston. Gary, also wanted to clarify in the last segment, we suggested that the one under works with the T1000. It doesn't, just with an 1100 plus or a 1200. Mm, okay, good point. Well, that, actually, that leads to the next topic. Okay. And that's how you get data out of one of these things to the rest of the world. Uh, Mark, you've got, what, a couple of modems here, some adapters for the telephone. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. <clears throat> what I have here is a, a couple of products that we carry in our, our catalog. One is the, uh, the Whirlport modem. It's a, uh, one of the world's smallest haze compatible battery operated modems. It works on a, uh, a 9 volt battery. Mm -hmm and uh, it just plugs into the, the back of a laptop computer and voila, you've got instant uh, communications at 1200 baud or 2400 mm -hmm. baud. And it even supports uh, an acoustic cup adapter that can be put on the mouthpiece of the phone. Or acoustic cups uh, are not as reliable as a direct connect. Mm -hmm. So thus, there's a, there's a problem there, and we have two, two solutions. This has been popular for the last several years. It's called the uh, blackjack. And but it just plugs into the phone. Yeah, you unscrew the mouthpiece mm -hmm. of the phone, a round uh, mouthpiece, right. and put this over Good old-fashioned old phone. Mm -hmm. Good old-fashioned yeah. phone. And, uh, and that just moves over the phone, right? It just, you don't screw it on or anything. Yeah, it just, just puts, clamps, uh, clamps right, right over it. So does it, do they ever come off? Yes, yes they do, and there's also an arrow here. And I don't know, at least I have a problem with that, <laughs> trying to figure out whether it's up or down, and I, I've used this for years, uh -huh. and I still have a problem with it. So now we have a brand, new, improve. a brand new product, and this is uh, uh, called the, uh, the Data Mouth. And it will actually screw right on there, and it has a, uh, a little additional electronics, so there's, it's, it's, uh, it's more accurate. Is it a real mouthpiece also? It's a real mouthpiece. So you can talk through it and also plug your modem in there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, what so about the modem? And it's less it looks like a little bit like a race yeah, car. Yeah, what's this funny little red thing? <laughs> yes. Now, this is, we don't carry this in our catalog. This is the uh, MyGent uh, modem. Uh, it looks nice, but uh, looks are not everything. I'm, I'm performance oriented. It does not have the, uh, the LCD light, so you know whether you're connected and at what speed. Mm -hmm. oh. It doesn't support acoustic cup. And if you're traveling to Europe, the, the world standard is CCITT, mm -hmm. and it doesn't support CCITT So it's okay in the USA, it's just mm -hmm. not good overseas. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the stuff, George, you have in front of you. And I know you've talked well, before about using your laptop. And that's right. And one of the, the problems, five and a quarter problem. Right. One of the problems in laptops is that most of the software that exists is in five and a quarter inch drives. And, and the, almost every one of the portables are three and a half. The three and a halfs are nicer drives, but uh, there comes the problem of transferring. And uh, you think first you can go out and get yourself a five and a quarter inch floppy drive and do it. Unfortunately, the drives are standard, but the connectors are not yeah. standard. Every a vendor seems to have a different connector in the back of the machine, and some of them change connectors with models. So, mm -hmm. what ha what's happened to me is I've become co almost completely dependent on LapLink. LapLink uh, plugs into the serial port, and uh, I have an, it's screen driven mm -hmm. and allows me to transfer data back. What, and what's forth. the transfer data rate? Uh, about yeah. 115 kilobaud, Gary. Okay. Uh, big files take quite a while, but uh, most of the for most of the files it happens pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. There's error checking. 
you can get around your directories pretty easily. It's, it's pretty good. It's not quite a shell, but it, it certainly takes the pain out of mm -hmm. having to have it, uh, one of these things around. Mm -hmm. So I do really believe that we're, the software will, is your, is your solution will, the hardware? will overcome the hardware solution. Okay, Gary, at the beginning we were talking about screen quality on laptops and uh, we have a kind of Magnus solution called MagdaView. Chuck over there is going to show us a way that you can be working on a presentation on a laptop, then go into a big meeting and actually take the output of your laptop, I guess, Chuck, right. and display it. Show us how you do that. Well, this is, this is the MagdaView. This is uh, basically the same technology as your LCD screen, except that it's transparent and it replaces the LCD screen on your computer. And uh, this is just the, the pattern. There's nothing. There's no information being transferred here now. Uh, could you bring the lights down just a little bit? And I'm going to transfer the graph that's sitting here on my computer, redirect it to this as if it were an external monitor, and that will be projected through the overhead projector onto the screen. Thusly. It's a great marketing tool. Okay, so that's a, that's a graph that's on your laptop right now. This graph is on my laptop, and as soon as I have redirected the output to this as if it were an external monitor, it appears on the overhead. Stuart, I've used one of those, something mm -hmm. like it. Great I've presentation given talks. tool. I've given talks where all of my slides are on the computer. Hmm. I just put this on the overhead, and away I go. I can't tell you how efficient it is when you're traveling and having to do presentations. So no, you avoid what, about, that? what about the resolution, though? That's what the CGA resolution, resolution is as good as the CGA. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's, it's not the quality of the slide. Newer ones are no, coming out. EGA. It isn't the quality yeah. of the slide. But the amazing thing mm -hmm. is you can fix a slide <laughs> Right before the sure. presentation. Yeah. That's right. You know, you avoid that hard copy problem and the whole mechanical problem of creating the slide or the, or it's, the transparency. It's done more toward making a presentation very productive and very easy to quick uh, to, to tailor to different audiences than anything I've seen, Gary. Chuck, what's the name of that again? It's called. This is called a Magnaview, Duquesne Magnaview. Any idea what it costs for something like that? Oh, uh, they run between the thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. Thousand and fifteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There is about, an EGA version in the works too uh, later this year. Yeah, there's about four different versions, Stuart. Mm -hmm. uh, Kodak makes one they call Slideshow, and there's, there's two or three others. There's several Japanese versions. George, Chuck, Mark, mm -hmm. thank you very much. That's our look at laptop peripherals. Hope we'll see you here again next week on the Computer Chronicles. Random access file this week. You should have bought that Macintosh last week. Apple just announced some hefty price increases on Macs, laser printers, and other Apple products. The basic Mac 2 goes up $1,100 to $4,869. The basic Mac SE goes up $400 to $3,169. And the Laser Rider 2 goes up $400 to $4,999. Well, they're ganging up on IBM again. This time, the clone makers are going after the microchannel architecture bus on the PS2 computers. NEC, Compaq, Hewlett Packard, Epson, AST, Olivetti, Tandy, Zenith, and others have announced a new bus standard called EISA. The group says the new bus will offer all the features of IBM's MCA, but will be able to handle AT-compatible boards. Wendy Woods reports in her News Byte service that Steve Jobs has set a date for the unveiling of his first Next computer. The rollout will take place on October 12th in San Francisco. The product is expected to be an academic workstation featuring superior sound and graphics. The machine will run Unix. Scientists at Bell Communications Research in New Jersey have reported a major breakthrough in neural chip technology. They say they have developed a chip which can be taught rather than programmed. The neural network chip features six neurons and 15 synapses, which act like a 15-chip parallel processor. During training, the synapses are either strengthened or weakened, depending on the correctness of the computer's conclusions. The nation's first computer virus trial opened in Fort Worth, Texas last week. The defendant is accused of planting a virus inside the computer system of a former employer after he was fired. The virus destroyed 168,000 records before it was discovered. The hacker faces a possible 10-year prison sentence. Time now for this week's software review. Here's Paul Schindler. It's not much of a message, but I'm not much for wearing t-shirts. I only put this one on Socrates here to let you know that you can make your own t-shirt at home with a new kind of Macintosh package, Chest Top Publishing. I love that name. You get a special ribbon, and with that and an iron, you can turn any clip art into a t-shirt. Now, most clip art is awfully small. The advantage of Chest Top Publishing, besides the special ribbon, is that its art is big enough for a t-shirt. Also, the program reverses lettering, since otherwise the letters come out backwards on the shirt. 
Chess Top Publishing does not include a package for handling the art. You need to have Mac Paint or any other program that will accept Mac Paint files. We're using Super Paint here. Now, if you want color, buy color ribbons or use these fabric color crayons. Chess Top Publishing runs on the Macintosh and costs $60 from Unison World Software in Berkeley, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. The Software Publishers Association handed out its Platinum Label Awards last week to 17 software titles that have sold over a quarter million copies. Among the winners were Hardball and Test Drive from Accolade, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, Print Shop Companion, and Load Runner from Bruderbund. Other companies with winners included Data East, Electronic Arts, Epics, and Microprose. Lotus has started a new upgrade program for buyers of 123 version 2.01. Buy 123 now, and you can upgrade to 3.0 for free when the new version of the program eventually comes out. Finally, beware the desktop publisher with a guilty look on his face. Police have arrested Paul Seinfat and charged him with forgery after he used his computer to create very convincing fake cashier's checks and purchase order forms. The DTP hacker used his fake checks to buy computers all the way from Massachusetts to Maryland. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Cynthia Steele. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte, Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $3 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.